Hi, it's Patrick Caldwell here, and you're listening to the Savvy Dentist Podcast. Welcome to the Savvy Dentist Podcast with Dr. Jesse Green, the show where great dentistry meets great business. Listen in each week as we bring you an inspiring person who will share their story, ideas, and business techniques to help you create a practice and a life you love. And now introducing your host, Dr. Jesse Green. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. Today, we are having a conversation with a really good friend of mine, endodontist from Brisbane, Dr. Pat Caldwell. How are you, mate? I'm very well, thanks, Jesse. Thanks for having me. Mate, it's, oh, it's an absolute pleasure. Thanks for coming on the show. And uh, it, we're going to have a bit of fun today. I'm looking forward to diving into the into the conversation and uh, and unpacking a few things. But, mate, before we get into that, I just want to run through your, your bio for a little bit for those who are not from Brisbane and who, who may not know you. Mate, you did your Bachelor of Dental Science at the UQ, University of Queensland, and finished in 1998. Yep. And uh, you became a Navy dentist for a while, and that's where we first met. And uh, you did lots of really fun and interesting stuff there, which I'm super keen to hear about because I only heard the uh, I only heard the uh, sanitized version through the through the uh, Navy uh, channels. So I'm looking forward to hearing what really happened with your career. It's going to be a lot of fun. And you then went and did an endodontic master's degree and completed that in 2005. So, mate, have I covered most of that pretty clearly? Yeah, from a professional point of view, that's that's pretty much it. Yeah, now for the unprofessional point of view. <laughs> <laughs> so, mate, you're, you're a Brisbane boy. That's um, right. You grew up in Brizzy? Yeah, I grew up in Logan City. Um, so, that was a... That was the sort of place that you, you tend to grow up in and, and leave as soon as you can, you know, <laughs> as soon as you, you have the ability to. Um, and, yeah, we, I, was, I was born in New Zealand originally and I was about four years old when I moved to Australia. So my father was Australian, mother was um, – oh, sorry, my, my mother was Australian, my father was a Kiwi and we moved over here. And uh, I was probably about 10 years old when, when my father – seemed to switch allegiance from the All Blacks to the Wallabies and I probably <laughs> followed suit at about that, that age too. Are you regretting that decision now? Oh, well, I, I can <laughs> switch back and forth as required. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, that's a really interesting thought. So do you consider yourself Kiwi or do you consider yourself Aussie or you're somewhere in the middle? You're stuck in the middle of the uh, ditch. Yeah, I, I probably, if, if I was being honest, I'd probably say I'd consider myself Australian um, but I obviously have a lot of Kiwi relatives and and I definitely identify in in some aspects as a Kiwi and and quite clearly if you couldn't be an Aussie you'd be a Kiwi so um, yeah probably got the best of both worlds there. Yeah you're actually really lucky. Um, I reckon the Bledisloe Cup games must be a fantastic family time in your house mate you can't lose and, yeah. um, and so everyone's a winner so great have a bet each way. That's it. Yeah, beauty. So, mate, you went to school in Brisbane, or did you go to school? You started your schooling in, in New Zealand, or did you do all no, that? No, here? no, no. Did did my schooling in um, in Brisbane in Logan City. Yep. Okay. And so, when you were going through school, when did you first think about becoming a dentist? Had you always wanted to be a dentist, or were you kind of thinking about that as you went through high school? Uh, I didn't particularly want to be a dentist. I was thinking about being a doctor. Uh, for a while, my my parents weren't particularly well off, and, and they worked pretty hard and sacrificed a fair bit to put me into a private school. Yeah. Um, and that was all with the aim of getting a good education. And yeah, all I knew growing up was that I was going to um, get myself into university and then wait tables or, or wash dishes or whatever to put myself through university in order to get a, a decent job. Where that job had the same title as the degree that you did at university. Yeah. Um, so that's sort of how I was brought up. Um, I was interested in medicine and then, uh, funny story actually, I had lost my mouth guard and we had a, a footy game coming up uh, and I was a bit terrified of running on the field without a mouth guard. So I remember it pretty clearly. It was a stinking hot day, you know, Brisbane summer, and I – left school at lunchtime and I, I wandered down the road to the local dentist to get a new mouth guard. Yeah. And a uh, stinking hot day, I went in, it was beautifully cool and air conditioned in there and I went in and it was it was nice and clean. Um, and 
he was he was a really nice bloke. He took an impression for a mouth guard, and he said, you know, do you want me to check your teeth? I won't I won't charge you anything. And he did that really quickly. Did a quick checkup. Yep. He said, you've got a good set of choppers, out you go. And I went out and I paid $80 for it, yeah. which was at that time I'd worked for 16 hours pushing trolleys <laughs> to, at, at the local target in order to pay that $80. Yeah. Um, and the next time I went back and got my mouth guard, and, you know, that was all of 10 minutes work for him. And I said to him, is that your Jaguar out the front? Uh, it, it was a Jaguar sitting out the front and the number plate read my V12. And he said, yeah, yeah it's, it's nice, isn't it? And I thought, you know, that, that sort of stuck in the back of my head as, as perhaps something that might be worth pursuing yeah. uh, in terms of, you know, the potential rewards. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, that was pretty much it. And went to uni, wasn't really sure what I wanted to, what I wanted to do. At that stage, you, um, to do dentistry, you had to do a year of science and then, or, or pharmacy or something like that and do particular subjects that then rolled into second year dentistry. So I started off in science, um, mucked around for a year or two and, and eventually decided dentistry would be the go. Fantastic. And so just coming back to those, uh, those days of pushing trolleys around Target, um, yeah, what was – was that the only job you had as a kid growing up? Was it that same job throughout or did you have others as well? Because I had a few shockers when I was a kid. <laughs> was well, um, well, Target was my first job and I did that for a couple of years. But then once I turned about 16 or – yeah, about 16 years old, I started working at the Hilton in Brisbane, which is where my mother worked. Yeah. Uh, and then – uh, my sister was working there as well, so they got me a job in there washing dishes, uh, which was pretty good actually because you could work sort of longer days, you could work nights as well, and that that pretty much went through university as well until I got the Navy scholarship. And actually, I stayed on for a little bit once I got the Navy scholarship, um, and and that was actually that was a pretty big part of my youth, I guess, or, or my young adult years working at the Hilton, yeah. um, especially before I got the Navy scholarship we, uh, because we just – you met a lot of people working there and a lot of the people there were students. They were in the same boat and there was this – you know, no one was afraid of hard work. You took whatever hours you could get and, you you know, you worked till 2 a.m. Saturday morning and then you rocked up again at 8 a.m. To, to start a – an eight or a, a 12 or a 16 hour shift, you know, when the hours are on, on offer. Mate, I'm thoroughly uh, jealous of you because I got knocked back by the Hilton and, the, and those crowd. I, I don't think I met the standard for, for their what employment. What do you do to get knocked back by the Hilton? I, I don't know, <laughs> but um, my, my, uh, my uh, fall from grace there was, it was profound because I was then relegated to cotton chipping as a student, oh, which was yeah. hard work. So, <laughs> but anyway, mate, so, so you worked there throughout you know, school and then through uni and all the rest until the Navy came along and yep. what was the what was the impetus to join the navy was it again something that you thought uh, this is a, a path to you know an employment opportunity or path to learn things or was it that something you thought wow this is a path to adventure and something i really want to do or, or all of the above um i i wasn't very good at, at stepping outside of my comfort zone and i saw the navy as a way to force myself to do that yeah. um there's a there was a bloke i worked with at the hilton who was studying engineering and he was in an undergrad with the navy so the navy was sponsoring him through engineering so yeah. that's that's probably where i first heard of the concept um but primarily it was just ultimately it, it was a way to you know not have to work so hard during uni uh, that's <laughs> what it came down to. And the, and the day that I got my letter, because I applied for the Air Force and the Navy and I got the, the Air Force letter of acceptance first. And it, I got home and it was, a, uh, a again, a stinking hot Brisbane summer yeah. night and it was 2 a.m. and I'd, I'd gone from uni. I was working, I was at uni all day and then I went straight down the Hilton and washed dishes for six or seven hours, yeah. drove home, 2 o'clock in the morning, just just sweaty and disgusting and uh, I got that letter saying that we're going to pay you what I could earn at the Hilton for a year yeah. uh, just, for, just for turning up to uni. And I thought, that's fantastic. It, it, was, um, it was a really wonderful thing for me. Yeah, I had one of those scholarships as well. And I think our motivations were very similar. Um, and like you, it was a wonderful experience and, and a wonderful respite from 
I suppose having those jobs that uh, I think as students, we all, or most of us had a job going through uni. I think most of our year group had a way of supporting themselves and, mm. and, uh, and going into the Navy was, you know, a, a good way of uh, getting, getting a few bucks and, uh, and, you know, being able to focus pretty much on your studies and your social life. Um, mm-hmm. Mate, so you joined the Navy in 1999, correct? Yeah, so that's when I started working with the Navy. Yep. And how was that? Um, it was a it was a little bit of a baptism of fire because the first job that I went to, there weren't any other Navy dentists there. So there was a, a dentist who uh, was very experienced. So from a clinical point of view, he was able to mentor me, but there wasn't anyone there permanently who was a, a Navy officer mm-hmm. um, to sort of help me um, – helped me work out how to run a department. So I was basically straight into trying to run the department. Some some more senior dentists sort of came to NARA. I was working in NARA every, uh, every now and then to help out. But, you know, ultimately, um, and they were very helpful, but ultimately I was trying to run the place myself. And certainly now when I look back at the way I was doing things, uh, I think I may have been led astray by my senior sailors, by my senior <laughs> managers <laughs> a little bit in terms of what was appropriate and what wasn't. Um, and I was probably very easily led astray at that point. <laughs> uh, but that was interesting for me because – the Navy over time puts you on courses and you learn things about leadership and how to manage people and, you know, you work out what works for you and what doesn't. But there's a little bit to be said for just experience and maturity in that as well. Yes. And as a uh, 22 or 23-year-old um, having to sit down with 45-year-olds who were bringing problems to you, um, and just in in my head, thinking, why on earth are you coming to me? You know, <laughs> this doesn't. It just didn't make sense to me. But that's that's the way it worked. Um, and you know that I, I guess to an extent that probably happens with most dentists or, or young professionals when you graduate and you go out into the workplace and you're automatically put into a position of authority and forced to deal with with issues. Um, and often with you know that that title and that position automatically makes um, your subordinates see you as someone who, you know, might be able to understand and manage certain situations in a certain way. And without, unless you've got a natural flair for it, without some sort of framework to to work with, um, it can be pretty challenging. Um, But, you know, in terms of being a dentist and a place to go when you graduate, it, it is a wonderful situation because you, from a clinical point of view, you're, you're usually going to go somewhere where there's a mentor mm. uh, who will look after you. You've got a reasonable amount of control in terms of what you're doing and you've got um, patients that will, will come in and not require you to sell anything to them or, yep. you know, most of the time they're, they're um, fairly obedient in terms of what you you might suggest they require um, and they'll, they'll comply fairly quickly and you've generally got pretty good facilities and, and materials and support available to you. As you move through your, your career as a dentist, you tend to start to um, just wish that you had a little bit more control in, in certain aspects of yep. your professional life in the Navy. But, um, you know, it, it's not for everyone, but in, in terms of ways to start out, I think it's a pretty good, yeah, cool. good way to start out. Cool. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you've just joined us, we're speaking to uh, Dr. Pat Caldwell, uh, endodontist from Brisbane, and we're just recounting some of his uh, Navy days. And, Pat, as, you're, uh, as you've, you know, gone to uh, HMS Albatross there and now and, and you found yourself in charge of the department, um, you know, basically, welcome to the Navy, here's the deep end, um, <laughs> see how you go with that. Um, what sort of situations, I know you said you were um, you know, trying to guide some older, you know, staff members, 45-year-olds through, through whatever challenges they might have been having. Does anything really stick out for you as a memorable I don't know, a bit of a bit of a memorable thing you had to deal with. Uh, I I don't know if you've ever been in this situation, Jesse. But when you um, when you have a 
um, group of of younger people working together. Um, <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? No, look, sometimes there's there's personality yeah. clashes, and that's yeah, sure. that's what it comes down to most of the time. Yeah. And um, you know, I'd I'd occasionally, and they were never never really big things, but I'd be listening to the stories and and just not really being able to comprehend how this situation could arise or how it could even be a problem. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's tough sometimes, trying to put yourself in the shoes of the person that, that has the issue. And, and the issue always seems far bigger to the person that has the issue. Of course. And, and trying to appreciate where they're coming from. Um, you know, that, that's probably one of those times where you have the – where the experience and the, you know, just the, the framework to work within helps you out. Yeah. You know. So did you, you know. de- did you develop your own framework for that Pat, or or was there some sort of uh, mentoring process that gave you a framework in the navy, or did you just kind of have to sit and think, okay, well, how am I going to create an environment, a framework, a a, a, a a toolbox here to work with so that I can handle these situations? How did you uh, resolve that issue? Oh, look, I just bumbled along at the time um you know I, I i certainly had more senior guys around that i could speak to yeah. uh you know if i needed to and um you know guys like peter Faturis up in sydney um he he was always very useful and um commodore dowsett yeah came and visited a, a few times and you know in terms of experiences there's no one who's more experienced at uh, you know working the navy than than he was, um, you know, so that that was pretty helpful. Uh, most of the training in the navy that I found useful and applicable came much later on in my career. Yeah. So they would train you at a time when you were supposed to be <laughs> looking after subordinates. Yeah. So you know that probably wasn't till I was I'd been in for five or six years. Yep. You know that you're doing those courses that are specifically aimed at management and leadership sure. skills i mean there's, there's certainly some early on but it wasn't until i did those courses and then i thought oh yeah okay yeah i can see how this applies and i can see how that you know would have been useful or how, how i could have managed that yeah cool. better at the time so do you think those lessons have held you in you know good stead i'm assuming they have but yeah you know, at what point did some of those lessons transfer across to you know you're in private practice now uh, is anything from those early experiences, you know, still with you? What, what have you taken along the way? I think one of the big things that I learned was when I was first in that situation of trying to manage the department, I just wanted to do everything myself and I wanted it all done in a particular way. Um, and one of my um, one of my senior sailors, um, Andrew Marsh at the time, uh, she sort of came and said to me, "Look, you're not you're not using me. I can do this stuff. I yeah, can yeah. I can manage the department. Um, I, you know, that's that's what I'm here for." And I thought about that, and then I I sort of I changed the way I did things there. I started delegating, and um, as I sort of rose through the ranks a little bit, um, and eventually I ended up in Sydney, and I was the the fleet dental surgeon, um, and I had some some really clever men and women working for me up there. And I had I had one of them, Jacob Smith. He came to me when I was leaving, and he said, "I I really appreciate how you just told me what you wanted me to do, and then let me do it." Yeah. And that took me a little while to figure out that that was a really great way for some, maybe most people to function. If I just gave them a framework and said, look, we want to achieve this, um, lots of them would do it ways that I wouldn't have done it. And yeah. I would look at, you know, even if they'd written something and I, I didn't, it, it, I wouldn't have used those words. Um, but I learned to just say, well, it doesn't matter as yeah. long as we're going to get achieve the outcome that we want to achieve uh so that was something that was that was probably one of the biggest things I, I took away you know just trying to work out how to get people to do things for me that would achieve a goal um and and just seeing 
some of those people blossom as well and they were given the freedom to achieve things. Um, probably went a little bit overboard on that sometimes and not, not giving enough guidance. <laughs> um, so so, so the boundaries are a little too far out in some yeah, cases, yeah, you think? Yeah, a, a bit too loose or, you know, ex- expecting thing, people to do things that were unrealistic of them yeah. um, that maybe that they didn't have the skills for. Um, that, you know, occasionally I saw that being a bit defeating for them because they just couldn't do it, you yeah. know. Um, and, and probably needed a little bit of a push in the right direction. So that's that's probably the main thing uh, that I took away. And and that was something that, again, came up in those later courses uh, that I recognised. Yeah. And I thought, yeah, actually, that, that makes sense. But that's a really good skill, isn't it, to be able to, you know, focus on the outcome and say to someone, you know, I'm not here to micromanage you. I have faith in your ability to deliver this. Um, yeah here's the outcome make it make it happen in any which way you know is is appropriate and use your initiative and and you know and skills to to bring that to bear um i think it's a wonderful lesson that you know all of us can probably you know take heed from um you mentioned that you were the fleet dental surgeon and clearly before you became the fleet dental surgeon you would have had some time at sea i know for instance you spent some time on hma success Mm -hmm. as the dentist there um and this is as a GP, right? Not as an endodontist at that point in your career? That's right. Yeah. Yep. Cool. So, you, you on HMA Success, which has a luxury custom-made <laughs> um, dental surgery, compared to, I must tell you, the hard yards that I did lugging damn dental chairs up and down, ladder bays and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, you had the luxury life, mate. Um, but where was the... Um, where was the destination that you enjoyed going to most? Where did you, where did you sail to and, and what was so fun about it? Uh, well, first, uh, I should point out that I did plenty of lugging of equipment around uh, <laughs> oh, hey, because I sailed in Canimla and Menorah a bunch of times yeah, and fair Newcastle cool. and Adelaide. And, uh, yeah, there, there was a fair share of uh, lugging that gear around, so I know where you're coming from. <laughs> and, and it was the worst job in the Navy. Well, wasn't uh, it amazing how that stuff. the stores guys would just disappear? Mm. As soon as that yeah. dental chair was anywhere yeah, well, near the dock, that just fair disappeared. Enough. Yeah, <laughs> I would too. But anyway, sorry, I digress. Yeah, so uh, look, I think um, when, I, when I think back about that, the the feeling that you had when you were on the bus, so that a ship would, you know, you might be at sea for – anywhere from a few days to, to two weeks or I did a four-week stretch once. Yeah. And, um, you know, those times at sea are really for working. You know, you're, you're yep. there, you can, you can get a lot done, you've got nowhere to go, you know, it's a 20-second it's a walk to work sort of thing. Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's what it comes down to. And um, by no means am I saying we worked hard compared to some of the other people on the ship. You know, the guys who were keeping the ship running worked um, worked more hours than than we did, and um, you know, probably got a lot, lot less sleep than we did. But regardless of that, when you you know you're coming into a port, especially if it was somewhere interesting mm. like you know uh, Phuket or or a you know, Pacific sort of port, if you're coming into Port Beeler or something like that, you know, there's a bit of a build up there and people start to get excited. And, you know, when the, say the ship goes to anchor and they, um, they bring out some, some smaller boats that you jump on and you go ashore and there's a a bus waiting to take you into the main part of town and you're on that bus. That's one of the best feelings in the world. (laughs) You know, it's, it's pretty fun because you're there with, uh, you know, a couple of hundred people, you know, and a whole bunch of your mates, yeah. um, and you know when when you try to compare all those different places, um, I'd I'd have to say Phuket, you know, places like that were up there because they were just so different. Yeah. Um, but we had some amazing times in Australian cities as well. You know, filling into Darwin or Townsville or, or Adelaide. Um, you know, just some some fantastic times there, uh, and those sorts of fun times, those parties, uh, something that's that's hard to replicate anywhere. I think you know, without that really close working environment that you have with um, with your shipmates. Yeah, it's 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 certainly a lot of fun, and uh, certainly I remember sailing around to a few places as well, and and again having those runs ashore, uh, always as you as you're coming into harbour, you know, as you you rightly point out, that sense of anticipation, excitement goes goes up quite a lot. Um, mm. 
I'm curious to know about your dental experiences at sea because when I first went to sea as a dentist, though we had no x-rays, I took one tooth out at sea and I took the <laughs> snapped the crown off it. Yeah. I was, I was uh, first or second year out of uni and my poor old dental assistant just looked at me as the beads yeah. of sweat were yeah. running down my forehead. <laughs> Sure. And, uh, which we got it out. Um, mm. And Mick, the dental assistant, goes, uh, Cowhorn's boss. And, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so it was, thank, thank goodness we got it out. But I'm curious to know whether you had any particular experiences, you know, like that at sea where you just, you know, they, they're etched in your memory. Uh, look, I think, you know, one of the best bits of advice that I got when I, when I went to sea, and um, so this was from my fleet dental surgeon who was David Dugan at the time. Um, He told me that what he primarily wanted from me was to do a good PR job for Navy Dental. Yeah. Um, And he said, you know, do good dentistry but do a good PR job. And part of that, which, you know, you learn eventually from experiences like the one you had was not doing anything that could particularly go wrong. Yeah. You you were supposed to be there to to help the – Navy personnel do their job, not hinder them, and yeah. and so you know you 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 definitely learn those. But I think it's the the similar sort of situ- situations that any young dentist would be in through through lack of experience, and exactly that situation you're describing where you you break a crown or something like that. I think the the things that were the um, most disconcerting were things like you do a simple you know, simple DO restoration and that person then happens to have a whole lot of post-op pain. Yeah. Um, um, but instead of them going home and complaining to their family, you're sitting at dinner with them and they're complaining to everyone around them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and you're just wanting to shrink and, <laughs> and disappear. Yeah. So, uh, you know, try and explain it away as best you can. Um, so, I mean, they, those that that's part of the difficulty in, in terms of treating people that you live and work with and only treating people that you live and work with. Yes. Um, I mean, managing those situations. And definitely, uh, you probably would have experienced this, but on an FFG, when you set up your dental department, it's, r- it's right down the aft end of the ship. Yeah, so um, an FFG, so ladies and gentlemen, an FFG is a guided missile frigate, uh, one of the older ships in the Navy, which shows that Pat and I are getting old too. Sorry, mate, just <laughs> just, right. just, to, just to cut across you there. Um, yeah. Sorry, mate, go on down, down the aft battle station, yep. Yeah, so in a fairly small space, in fact, when you think about it, it's, it's ridiculous, yeah. the, the space that you're in. Um, and uh, when you hear the the call over 1MC that there's a man overboard drill. Yeah. Uh, um, and that's the – I mean, the chairs we used were heavy, right? They yeah. were super heavy. They were, yeah, yeah. And it's the only time I've ever seen one of those chairs with someone in it slide across the deck because <laughs> – <laughs> Because when hopefully the, ship, the handpiece wasn't in there. Yeah, mouth. for a man overboard drill, you you do a U turn. Yeah, I know. Yeah, and those ships really roll. You know, they roll about forty five degrees. Um, so I mean that that was interesting. But we had pretty good equipment actually. Yeah. The you know the stuff that came in just as I was um, going to see was was pretty good. It was basically a deck equipment, but compacted into some boxes. So the equipment we had was good. We could take X rays and. After I left, um, I know Marco Sullivan, who's in the Air Force, did a, a lot of good work setting up some digital X-ray units. So yeah. now they've got handheld X-ray units with digital sensors connected to a um, to a laptop, and you know I, I think it's all pretty good stuff. And the work we did was it was good. You know, yeah. um, situ- you know situations um, could could make it challenging sometimes, but the work we did was just as just as um, good as anything you'd do ashore, um, you know, provided the circumstances yeah. around you were okay. Yeah, look, the, the lesson I got when I had that it's incident taking the tooth out in the crown, you know, it was decoronated. I remember thinking that I, I was a basically a new dentist. Like you went to um, Albatross very early in your career and I went to sea very early in my career. And, and the similarities, of course, are that, um, you know, largely you're on your own to an extent, mm. um, and particular C. But I remember the lesson that I took away from that it was never to be bullied by the patient into performing mm. treatment you're not 100 percent comfortable with. Um, yeah. I, thankfully, I had a PA to work from. I just couldn't take an updated one. 
Um, but I remember vividly going, okay, well, the lesson for me there is that patient came in in abject pain. I really should have just taken the pulp out, which, of mm-hmm. course, is you know, your bread and butter these days. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I had to learn to stand my ground and, and step into that role of being the dentist. So I think for as a young dentist, men, well, I think lots of young dentists kind of struggle with that to some extent. You know, they, they've got their degree and, and um, now it's about you know, owning that role to an extent. Yeah, um, for sure. I, I think lots of... Older dentists can can still struggle with Absolutely. things like being bullied by patients. Absolutely, it's, it's yeah. difficult. Yeah, it is, it is a tricky one. So, mate, um, I know you went off to do your endo degree uh, in the early two thousands, but before we get to that, um, what was the what was the weirdest place? I actually could be before in the navy or after. Navy, what's the weirdest place you've done endo? Done endo. Yeah. Um, well, that is. Oh, well, it, I mean, it's got to be on a, a ship. I don't know if it's weird, but I, I guess it would be. Yeah, it it probably – look, probably the most interesting was um, on board the USNS Mercy, which is a U.S. Navy hospital ship. Nice. So um, maybe about 2007 uh, went on a – a deployment called Pacific Partnership, and that's led by the the US, but a whole lot of different nations get involved. So there were Canadians and Kiwis and um, uh, a, a bunch of different defence forces there contributing. And that ship was – it's extraordinary. Um, it's, it's fairly common. It happens, uh, I think, every year. Um, and there's always Army, Navy and Air Force um, contribution to it. Um, but, I mean, we were on a ship and it had, I think, four dental surgeries. It had two dental GA surgeries. It had a lab on it. There was a CT machine. There were a 1,000 hospital beds and mm-hmm. eight operating theatres. Uh, and that was in Dili in uh, East Timor. So so anchored anchored yeah. there doing that. Um, and that, that was, I guess... <coughs> Um, you know, rewarding because it was um, local two Marines that came in and just wanted to hold on to their teeth yeah. if they could and we, we were able to provide fairly high-level care for them, you know, followed up with a, a CEREC on lay or crown because <laughs> there were three CEREC machines on board. Uh, so, you know, that, that was pretty interesting. That's in amazing, terms of yeah. yeah, yeah, cool. And so that's probably, you know, one of the best kitted out dental surgeries you'll ever see with that kind of gear. At sea, for yeah, sure. Yeah, certainly at sea. Yeah, absolutely. So, mate, um, you went on to become an endodontist um, and you did your specialty training back at the University of Queensland, completing it in 2005. Um, again, what, what led to endo? What was it about endo that attracted you to it? And, and you know, how do you kind of see that GP as the, GP years as the foundation for that? Um, look, I've been asked this a bunch of times, and uh, when I think back, I, I think that endo, I found endo to just be the skill that I had the most trouble getting my head around. Um, and I thought, you know, I just want to learn to do this properly. Yeah. Not that I was, you know, particularly skilled in any, you know, facet of dentistry, and, and that's probably part of what drove me to wanting to specialise, um, just the fact that I thought I'm never going to get the hang of, of all this stuff that we've got to do. Yeah. Um, and, and even now when I see what GPs, general dentists are able to do, the, the level of skill they have in so many different areas, um, that it blows me away actually. And I think that GPs have a, a far more difficult job than specialists have. And occasionally we get really difficult patients to deal with, difficult cases to deal with. But day-to-day stuff, I, I just don't know how general dentists do it all. Um, and, and I think that's that's really what drove me to it. I also really considered pursuing oral maxillofacial surgery, um, but endodontics was... Uh, it was an easier option, really. Just to, a shorter it was, one. It was easier to get into, and and yeah, it was it was shorter. It was only a couple of years ago that I'm seeing guys I went to uni with finally becoming oral maxillofacial surgeons, and yeah, I've wow. already been an endodontist for seven or eight years at that point. Um, but yeah, I, I I was fortunate in that I'd only 
I guess I'd only been out of uni for four years, so I still knew the people at Uni of Queensland yeah. and I had a, a fairly easy time of getting into it, into the degree, so I was pretty lucky at that point. Um, and, yeah, it, it, it was just... It was just the thing I found the most difficult, and I really wanted to to get in and and become comfortable with it. And I also like the biological aspects. You know, I liked I liked the the healing aspect of it all, and you know, helping people to to keep their teeth that they might otherwise lose. Cool. So, just coming back to the wanting to master it, I'm just picking up a sense. Are you a competitive kind of guy? Like, you give me a task, and I'm gonna kind of make sure I nail it. Is that you? Uh, mostly, yeah. <laughs> he says with a degree of hesitation, <laughs> yes. I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Um, so, mate, you were still in the Navy at that point, and obviously after you'd finished your training, you went back to the Navy for a period of time and and, and took on obviously more and more senior roles. Um, and then you went to China for a while, right? Yeah, when I, uh, when I finished up with the Navy... Um, yeah, I was at a point in my Navy career, and I think a lot of military dentists get to this point where you're looking down the barrel of doing more and more admin and less and less clinical time. Yeah. Um, and I had, at that time, you know, what I considered to be the best job in the world. And, uh, you know, working in Sydney with a, a surgery that looked out onto the harbour, and um, I was getting people telling me that I was doing a wonderful job as the fleet dental surgeon and nice. I wasn't doing anything. It, it was, you know, the people, the men and women that I had working for me um, that were just just really doing all the work and, and, you know, sometimes it was hard to impress on people that they were the ones that were achieving. Mm. Um, and they've, they've all gone on to do bigger and better things and it, it's great to see where they are these days. But... I, uh, I was just looking for something interesting to do and I'd always wanted to go and live overseas and I had some friends that were living in China at the time and I went and visited and I thought, yeah, this is interesting. And at the time, it was really the middle, you know, the depths of the, the financial crisis yeah. and there weren't a lot of – things were looking pretty bleak in the UK and, you know, we don't have that many places that we can easily go and work. Um, UK was one of them but – Things were looking pretty bleak, and I didn't look like I was going to get a job there. So, um, yeah, I just I just took off. You know, had a bit of money and and um, and a bit of long service leave up my sleeve. So, yeah, I just uh, headed over to China, and it took me a while to get a job there. Um, I, I sort of settled in Shanghai eventually, and um, eventually started working for a, a couple of sort of bigger hospital type clinics there um, but it was interesting there weren't there was no real referral culture over there so you know for for the Australians listening it, well for me at the time anyway it was quite different to the way that I was used to seeing dentistry practiced and yeah. things would get referred often um, and I've since sort of learned that around the world and in, in different uh, different countries that they're there isn't necessarily the referral culture that we have in Australia. You know, there's lots of places around the world where dentists just do their dentistry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and if something's hard they or, or, or difficult, they'll try it. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And they just um, get around it and they learn to do all sorts of things like place implants and do ortho and that sort of thing. Um, so that was interesting at the time. So I wasn't, you know, there was a city with, 21 or 22 million people in it yeah, and huge. As, as far as I was aware I was the only foreign trained endodontist working there. So, so um, working as a specialist or as a GP? I started off as a GP that's how I got the job yeah. um, and then about three weeks into it and when I realized I really couldn't do a scale and clean very well anymore um, <laughs> I, I just sort of went and said oh look I might just do the endo and they said okay and, and that worked out all right. Yeah, cool. but but I was still only working a couple of days a week. Yeah, there, um, which was great. You know, I had had time to travel around, and I started playing rugby and met some really interesting people um, that were. I mean, by virtue of the fact that those people, mostly expats, were living in Shanghai, and a lot of them, they weren't there with the company. They were there to just make their own way with whatever they 
they did. Um, so they, they were really different to, to people that I had met before and it was a different lifestyle. You know, I don't often get a, a, a call at, at 9.30 on a Tuesday night saying, let's go out for cocktails in Brisbane. <laughs> <laughs> so anyone listening, uh, if you if it is a Tuesday night and you're looking for someone to go for a cocktail, that's your man. <laughs> well, yeah, you'd probably wake me up if you tried to call me. <laughs> so it sounds like just listening to you speak about the, the people with whom you're interacting in Shanghai, it sounded like a different sort of person, like the ones that were there making their own way. Um, mm. Were they, you know, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial sorts of people or were, were they there trying to, you know, carve out a path for themselves in that regard or were they there for other reasons? Yeah, look, most of them were entrepreneurial in some way um, and, you know, China was the, it was the big thing at that time and I yeah. guess still is to an extent now. Um, but they, they were people who were, who were just there to, uh, you know, make, do their own business and, and try and build something, whether it be providing things to Chinese or whether it be providing things to the rest of the world. Um, and even the ones that were that were working for bigger companies, often they were a bit entrepreneurial as well. I mean, they'd, they'd work to get these overseas postings. And, uh, for example, there were a couple of architects that I knew and they were working in um, – working in architectural firms, earning really poor wages, like yeah. really, really not very good at all. And um, they were doing jobs that they would never, ever do back in their own country. Yeah. Um, they were in control of projects that were probably 10, 15 years away for them um, oh, back wow. at home. Yeah. So, you know, they're, they're, even though they were not you know, working for themselves in terms of their career, they were doing wonderful things yes. uh, by being there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that that's the sort of, um, you know, the, I guess just because there's fewer people around and when you're living in an expat, you tend to be a bit more open to new people and, you know, new experiences and that sort of thing. So you do tend to, you know, get out and about a little bit more. Cool. Um, yeah. So, mate, as you're interacting with those guys, and I know you've had some other business ventures beyond dentistry as well, mm. did some of that entrepreneurial spirit um, or, or learnings from China and, and hanging out with that crowd in Shanghai, as you've come back to Australia and obviously you've set up Brisbane Microsurgical Endodontics, which you know, is going really well, um, you know, did any of those lessons kind of come through and help you with that process? Uh, yeah, I mean... <sighs> When you're hanging around with entrepreneurial people, it's a little bit infectious, um, and you know we all love hearing those stories about someone who developed a product and you know is sleeping on their their you know programmer's couch to yeah. save money and and doing contra deals in order to get their website up and running, and then eventually made it big. And yeah, you know, they're they're all really interesting stories. And you know, I had even when I was doing my my masters um i had a, a small business where we were selling electronics on the internet uh, yeah. you know mp3 players and that sort of thing uh and i learned a, a lot from that in terms of i guess just how business on the internet works and um and just customer service as well i guess um you know from that there were, there were times when we would you know, something would go wrong and yep. you'd do whatever you could to, to correct the situation. And they were the, the people that were by far the most appreciative of, of what you'd done for them. And, you know, I see that now in dentistry as well. You know, they, God, they, uh, I had a case a couple of weeks ago. Um, I did a, you know, did a refilling for someone. I went back to the dentist, got a, a crown done. And um, less than 12 months later, they were back to see me because it wasn't feeling right. And uh, there, was a, there was a really large defect. It was a lower seven on the lingual. And I, I don't know if it was some sort of invasive cervical resorption or whether it was just plain old caries, but it was, it was massive. Yeah. Um, and maybe it was there, you know, when we did the root filling and didn't notice. And I just organized for him to see an oral surgeon and have the tooth taken out and he had a bit of a, you know, a time issue. So pulled some strings, got the tooth taken out, got the bill sent to me and 
that guy wrote to me and his dentist just the, the the loveliest letter about how much he appreciated what we'd done for him. Now, obviously, it's a really bad result, and value yeah. for money for him was was poor. Um, but there's those, you know, whenever I see something like that not going right, um, you know, I I really accept that part of me doing this job and charging people a lot of money for it is, is taking on responsibility to some extent for it. You know, yeah. those pa- patients definitely have to accept the risk yeah. um, that things might not go well, but, um, and I, ne- I don't offer guarantees or anything like that. Um, but when someone doesn't get the outcome that they'd like and I'd like for them, I, I do whatever I can to make it right for them. Uh, and that was certainly something I learned, you know, way back then. Um, dealing with people. Also learned that some people can be unreasonable <laughs> from the start, no matter what you do. Yeah. You'll never be happy yeah. that are looking for a, an argument. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that's just yeah. life, or, I guess, or, in general. <laughs> yeah, well, well, interestingly enough, there's a thing, what you've touched on is a thing called the recovery paradox. And um, it, it's what you've experienced and, and described there is quite uh, well known in the marketing literature where we, you know, we talk a lot about you know, patients will have a, or, or customers will have a certain tolerance for things going well. Uh, oh, sorry, go, going awry, I should say. Um, but it's how you recover from that that really makes or breaks the relationship. And clearly, you know, with that uh, uh, online business, you learn a lot about customer service. And I suspect you probably are of that nature anyway. Pat, you want to make sure that everything is right for people. Um, but that's obviously stood you in really good stead. And, and now, you know, you're getting letters from these patients who, you know, as you've indicated, have had probably not the ideal clinical outcome but you know you've handled it well and they're still grateful for you, you taking responsibility and getting it sorted for them it's, i think it's a wonderful outcome all around mm. Yeah. um so you, you've been selling your stuff online for a while and you know obviously um you know that that's been a great experience what did you learn about um you know internet marketing because i know you know you and i've you and i've had lots of discussion discussions over years and uh, and one of the things that I've always been drawn to during our conversations is that I always felt like I was talking to a kindred spirit, someone who kind of, you know, was interested in that. And uh, I know you've had some really good success with it. So I'm curious to know about the, what lessons came out of the MP3 business that you know, you've also borrowed. Um, yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that I've had a lot of success out of um, the these other businesses because – Certainly in terms of a monetary aspect, probably not wonderful success. Um, and that's, you know, that's just part of it. And to be honest, I enjoyed every every second of, you know, doing those other other things yeah. and, you know, selling selling the, the uh, electronics online. Um, you know, I learned that that was a difficult business to be in because there are a lot of people trying to steal stuff from you. You know, there's a lot of credit card fraud and that's that's probably what – ultimately just made us decide to to leave the business alone yeah um the uh you know i learned things just just things that blew me away actually in terms of how the internet was working and this was sort of early on you know in internet sales yeah, you know, yeah this yeah. was 2004 you know 2005 and yeah. um so people were really just feeling their way and you know for me you know, to find out that if you bought something online, the, the credit card processor would just check that the card number and expiry date were valid and there was money on the card and they would approve the, the transaction. And it was up to the to the retailer to ensure that whoever used that card owned that card. Yeah. So nothing was checked. The name wasn't checked. The, the address wasn't checked. Nothing like that. And then the, the credit card processors would then come back to you if someone had charged back and say, what are you doing? You know, so what, what are you doing sending out these products to fraudulent people? Um, yeah. People. Um, so that that was interesting. But I mean, at the time, um, a, a funny conversation I had, or a, a funny experience I had with my web programmer, uh, was one where she called me and said, "Look, I've just been to this conference, and uh, I've learned this really powerful." technique and I'm going to try it out on your website 
Uh, and I'm like, sure, I'll go for it. And uh, so this technique was called search engine optimization. <laughs> <So> <laughs> oh, it, wow. It hadn't really been heard of before then. Yep. And so our, our website was uh, was on the domain mp4store.com.au. Yeah. Um, so at that point, you know, MP3s were, were big, so yep. iPods are only just coming out, um, and you know, MP4s with the MP4 players with the the next generation of MP3 players, and she uh, did whatever she did. She just did you know meta meta tags or whatever, yep. and and we wrote some content and changed some of the words on the website to include MP3 player, MP4 player, yeah. Apple iPod. And we just zoomed to the to the number one position on Google, top of, top of you know, number one search result um, for a whole bunch of keywords. It wow. was as simple as that and stayed there for ages. Just If, if only we, it was that simple. Had a, yeah, so, I mean, that was a time when search engine optimization actually worked yeah. uh, and, and you didn't have to spend a lot of money for it. Yeah. Um, and it was extremely powerful because even then, you know, one click on Google for an MP3 player was a dollar or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So it was really expensive even back then um, to compete on Google. And, and part of that was because Google AdWords was fairly new as well and, yep. and people didn't really know how to use them and and people didn't understand that in the bidding process if if you only needed to bid 20 cents for a word but if you both bid 15 dollars you'd be paying 15 dollars dollars yeah so you know there there was a lot to learn there as well and i mean that was it, it's really interesting and it still fascinates me yes um but you know it's it's over over the years i think it's got more difficult and more difficult um to keep up with. Yeah, but and success has many different facets as well, Pat, because, you know, even though, you know, mp4store.com.au uh, didn't set you up to be the next Russell and Kogan, um, <laughs> um, sadly, um, but some of those lessons have obviously carried through with you because I know, you know, even in your practice, you've got, um, you know, A, you've got a podcast, The Endo Spot, which is going, you know, really well. It's got good listenership and, you know, it's really engaging. Um, and you've got a, a website that's, you know, it, it's got good content on there and it's really user-friendly. It's great with conversions and all those sorts of things. So it sounds to me like even though, you know, mp4store.com today wasn't, you know, perhaps the uh, the Uber of the 2005s, um, you know, still was very useful exercise. Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, and, and, you know, I guess anyone who's a small business owner knows that you've, You've got to wear many hats, haven't you? And yeah. Marketing is, is just one of them. And and there's no way around that unless you sp- want to spend a whole lot of money, you know, to get someone in to do it. Yeah. You've just got to at least be competent. Yeah, cool. And, and at least know what questions to ask as well. So I reckon mm-hmm. if you've got a basic level of understanding and you do have the cash to, you know, get someone in to help you. you yeah, you, sure. Yeah, you, know, you can ask intelligent questions so you're not going to be done over. Well, that's right. Yeah. Um, mate, so you after um, China, you came back to Australia, mm-hmm. uh, and you set up your practice. That's right. Uh, and you know you, you're in South Brisbane there, and so I'm curious to know, like starting a, a practice from scratch in any particular uh, you know GP or specialty practice, you know, comes with some challenges. Clearly, you know, there's no patients. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but equally, from your perspective, you've got to then develop a referral network, and you know, you've got to probably do a bit of direct to the public marketing as well as nurture referral base how's that been you know what what key things have helped you be successful not just in terms of your direct marketing but in developing the relationships with the gps and other referrers well when i first came back to brisbane and set up i uh i assumed that because i knew a lot of dentists because i was from brisbane yeah um that I would start getting referrals, uh, and that is just incorrect. Uh, it doesn't work like that. You know, every every dentist that's working in uh, Brisbane that, that I knew had been out of uni for ten years, and they um, they knew how to do endo. You know, a lot yeah, of them yeah. weren't really referring that much, yeah. and uh, they already had refer uh, people to refer to that they were comfortable with and, and happy working with. So. You know, any referral you pick up, um, unless they're brand new to the area, um, you really got to 
basically take it from someone else. Yeah. Um, so that that can be quite difficult. And certainly in my first few months, um, bearing in mind, I opened just as Brisbane flooded. So it was probably, you know. <laughs> so probably, it was 2011. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was probably the worst time in history to open a <laughs> specialist practice in an already, you know, fairly saturated endodontic market. Um, no, and, you no know, the, unintended. Yeah, exactly. Um, but it, uh, it took a little while to, to get going. Yeah. Um, and, you know, in hindsight, I probably didn't put as much effort into going out and meeting people as, as I should have. Um, and my, you know, my top referrers now, uh, people, there's one or two that I knew, but, but mostly people that I've met under, you know, under different circumstances on courses, things like that. Um, I don't, looking back on it, I, I, it's funny, it's, it's hard to work out where some of the referrers come from as well uh, yeah. because all of a sudden you'll just start getting referrals from a particular person and um, and and some of those referrals I've been working with for quite a while and we may have spoken on the phone but never actually you yeah. know talked in person um, so that's always good when you can get the opportunity to do that sort of thing but it really I mean um, in terms of Working with GPs, one of the things I did early on was I, I guess I'd been a little bit active on the internet with, you know, in groups, endodontic sort of groups. Yeah. And I sought out people that seemed to be really good at what they did. Yeah. Uh, and I, I found that a lot of them were using a particular software called TDO and I chased that down. There was one other user in Australia at the time. It was a little bit US centric yes. at that time. Uh, and the people I spoke to told me that the software was good, but it was the community that came with it that was by far the most valuable, um, which sounds a bit ridiculous because it wasn't cheap. Mm. Um, but by far the community that comes with it is the, the most valuable thing about TDO. So that really um, put me in touch with world-leading endodontists in terms of just skills and and thinking as well. And it exposed me to a completely different set of um, set of just ways of practice um, that I hadn't been exposed to before uh, and you know TEO hold an, an annual conference and I go over there I've missed one of them um, but other than that I go every year and they have speakers there that just blow your mind um, and you know now I, I haven't seen um, a dental lecturer for a long time that has blown my mind. I've seen guys and their skills are amazing and what their, their, their technical skills are outstanding. But, um, you know, TDO, when they're bringing in different doctors and epidemiologists and, and researchers that are doing things that may be outside the realm of dentistry, uh, but sort of open your eyes to these concepts that um, we don't get exposed to as dentists or we get a little bit blinded to because we're dentists. Um, and, and that sort of really blew my mind. But uh, TDO, the guys there are really focused on, you know, achieving outcomes and, and the right outcome for the patient. And when I started to realise this, it, it, it sort of changed the way I practice and it changed what I thought was important in terms of practising. Um, and, you know, some of the things that I learned to do, like... Um, placing cores, placing posts, that sort of thing was a challenge for me. But now that I, I do it routinely, um, I can really see the value in it from the patient's point of view because it just gets done yeah. at the time. And I've been in the tooth. I can see exactly what's what and where's where. I'm not having to dig out, you know, temporary filling material or or whatever to, to get in there and find it. But also I, I really see the value in terms of it from the referring dentist's point of view and, and, and you know, the, the biggest complaint I've heard from dentists about their endodontist is when they get a tooth back that's not restorable. Yeah. So the, yeah. the patient spent a couple of thousand dollars having a root filling done, comes back, you take all the filling out, and it's not restorable. Yeah. Um, and that just, that just shouldn't happen with 
uh, with the way I practice here in, in Brisbane now, yeah. um, yeah. it should come back ready to be restored. Um, and, you know, we put a lot of effort into making sure that the tooth is as as easy to restore as, mm. as possible. Uh, and it's funny, a lot of... Um, a lot of endodontists I've spoken to about the say that their referrers don't want them to restore the teeth because, you know, for whatever reason. And that's just not my experience. I've only ever had good feedback from it. I've got one or two referrers that ask me not to. Yeah. Um, they're mainly prosthodontists and, and some of the prosthodontists I work with ask me to do it specifically yeah, because yeah, sure. um, they appreciate it and they tell me which way to do it and that's that's fine. Um but, you know, that essentially as a specialist and as an endodontist, you have two lots of customers. You have your referrers and you have the patients. Absolutely. And primarily you're there to do the right thing by the patient. But other than that, you're there to do the right thing by your referrers as well. And that, that builds relationships, you know. Um, if we're, I really see it as if we're part of a team and we're here to help each other out. Um, and that's... That's the way I approach it, and um, you know that that seems to work really well for me. Yeah, look, Pat, I, what you're saying there makes uh, wonderful sense. And yeah, when I was actually living up in Brisbane and working there, um, I was one of those people who referred to, you and I can uh, attest to the uh, the happy day that it, it, that it is when a, a tooth comes back with a lovely root filling in there. But not only that, with the uh, the, the post if necessary and core ready to go it just makes you know gp's life much easier um one of the things that's really coming up for me as, as you're talking about this pat is you know you're saying that some of the other endodontists you know w- were reporting back that their gps didn't necessarily want them to um you know restore the tooth on their behalf uh yet that hadn't been your experience and I guess, you know, just wanted to touch on the on the notion of having, um, and this is really useful for general dentists as well, is having an ideal patient or, in your case, an ideal referrer as well as an ideal patient and, and being clear about who it is that you serve and, you know, customizing the experience to those people mm-hmm. who actually do appreciate that kind of service. Mm-hmm. Is that something that resonates with you? Um, definitely. And, and that's, um, you know, I guess... Um, I've, I've probably had the experience of um, working with one or two referrers where it just wasn't really working out in terms of, you know, our expectations of each other. Um, and that's fine. You know, there's, there's lots of endodontists in Brisbane um, and, you know, that the, we, we work pretty hard to, to, you know, sort things out so that there is a good relationship both ways and if it doesn't work out then it doesn't work out and I think it's the same thing you know for me with with patients there's patients that that aren't sort of towing the line in terms of what we require from them you know we make that commitment to them when we agree to treat them we make that commitment and uh, we're responsible in you know in certain ways for their treatment but they need to you know front up and do what they need to do as well and uh, we don't have any problems telling patients that they, they probably need to um, look somewhere else for their treatment as well. Um, yeah, it's it's just it doesn't make any sense. You've you've really got to you you get the work environment that you want by creating the work environment that you want. Yeah, absolutely. I I, uh, I really agree with that point, and it just translates across everything. Yeah, if you if you understand who it is you're looking to serve, what what sort of uh, experience you want to cre- to create for them, then you, you know, that's the foundation of any good marketing. Uh, it's the foundation of good business practice. It's the foundation of a happy life at work <laughs> too, which is you know one of the most important things. Um, listen, Pat, I reckon we've covered a lot of ground there, and um, one of the a couple of themes are really cropping up really um, consistently throughout your life journey. One is it seems you've had some really good mentors along the way, which has been great. Mm-hmm. It seems as well that you've been open to new ideas and you've explored other ideas and you've been able to take them, you know, I suppose cross-industry innovation, which is one of the things that um, tickles my funny bone a lot. Yeah, you know, I really enjoy that. And you've taken things from you know, either the military or your MP4 store and you've taken that into practice. And the other thing that, you know, knowing you personally is one of the things that I always um, think that you do particularly well is you manage to have a good business, a great business, and a really good life as well, which, you know, I think comes back to that last point you just spoke about. So, mate, kudos to you. That's fantastic. 
Yeah, thanks. And and that's something um, I've been uh, pretty focused on. And, uh, you know, in terms of that work-life balance, there, there came a point where, um, you know, I was sort of pushing things as much as I could with work and, and still taking the opportunities to get away. But I, I honestly felt like I was being a little bit overwhelmed in, ter- in terms of the mm. aspects of business. And I was starting to get to the point where I was thinking, gee, it would, would be nice just to turn up to work and work for someone else. Um, and you spoke about the mentors and I have had some great mentors along the way and, and certainly Navy guys count amongst them and the TDO guys count amongst them. Um, and I, I don't know, am I allowed to do a plug for you? <laughs> Oh, mate, if you want. <laughs> yeah, if you yeah. Mate, yeah. Um, cause, yeah. you know, I don't I certainly wouldn't want to hide the fact that that I've um I have had you helping me out the last year or so. Um and oh man, there's so many, so many times where there were just little problems that would come up and I wouldn't you know, I I I having you there was awesome to have someone just to toss things around with. Um but also you know, and you'd, you'd always come up with solutions that I hadn't thought of. And in all honesty, mate, none of it's rocket science, right? But nah. to have someone just explain that to you, someone who's thought about it a lot before yeah. and has, has done these things and discussed the issues with other dentists is just fantastic. But also having someone um, really – and what you did right at the start was reset me right from – go back to basics, strip it back and say, well, what – you know, how do you want to live? What do you want to, how do you want to live your life? And therefore, you're going to need to work this amount or, you know, um, earn this amount. And therefore, you know, you're going to work this many days where you're going to earn this much per day. How are you going to do that? And that was something that really sort of reinvigorated my appreciation for the practice and, and has made a significant difference. Um, to us as well. So, you know, I should take the opportunity to thank you for that. Uh, uh, mate, um, I actually th- feel a little bit embarrassed because all the work that's been done is you, mate. So, um, <laughs> that, 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 but I appreciate the kind words. Um, Pat, I think we might uh, arrange to meet next Tuesday night at 9.30 for cocktails at your place, mate. Because okay, uh, <laughs> I know Tuesday night's your cocktail night. Um <laughs> Pat, thanks so much for coming onto the show. You've been a wonderfully generous guest and sharing your experience with us and and those little insights. And one of the things that you know, as I'm listen, been listening to your story, because we've known each other for a long time now, mm-hmm. and but there's lots of little things that I just didn't know there, and I can see now how they've shaped your life, your story, and and all the little lessons that come out of that, and that you've taken into your practice. And I think that's one of the things that um, you know is really interesting. Is why um, you know when I see people creating a practice that's so, I suppose, reflective of the person driving it. It's, mm-hmm. it's really interesting to see and, and it's rewarding. So, mate, well done to you. That's, that's tops. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on. I've had a really good time. Uh, I've enjoyed it. it. It's very interesting to be on the other end of the interview. <laughs> um, I, I, I was thinking about it this morning. When you're, when you're interviewing someone, there's certain things you want them to open up on and, yeah. and um, what I've found in all my – Endospot podcast is that the interviewee it sometimes feels like they're trying to avoid the controversial stuff um, <laughs> and get the right message across. And I can understand where they're coming from. <laughs> so, uh, so, so we haven't so even I, touched on sex, politics, and religion, <laughs> mate. So we've done all right. That's great. So I appreciate uh, the opportunity. Uh, it's good fun, mate. Look, thanks for coming on the show. And for um, for those people that do want to go and listen to your podcast, the Endospot, mate, it, the web address is. Endospot.com uh, is a good way to get there, and there's links to iTunes so you can subscribe and download it, or you can just listen to it on the uh, on the web. Fabulous, mate. Well, um, I'll be tuning into your next episode, and uh, looking forward to catching up soon, mate. All right, thanks, Jesse. Thanks, mate. Thank you for listening to the Savvy Dentist Podcast. For more episodes, go to drjessegreen.com slash podcast. And to discover how you can go large with your practice, visit drjessegreen.com and download the free report.